Bibles this morning, turn to 1 Thessalonians. That's kind of a unique uh, book of the Bible, and it's one that I'm not in a lot. Um, it's definitely filled with eschatology, the study of the end times. But if you're kind of new in the faith, 1 Thessalonians is the 13th book in the New Testament. So about in the halfway mark, and it's right after the letter of Colossians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to begin today uh, a two-week mini-series. A two-week mini-series. You know me, when I do a series, uh, they last usually longer than that. But of course, uh, this is going to be, I believe, uh, two uh, wonderful messages to think about how thankful we are and how we know that God's favorite word is give or gave and how I've linked those together and I've entitled this series, Thanks and Giving. Let me give just a little bit of update on it. Today, of course, I'll be covering the first part. Next week, I want to encourage you to be here. Uh, we have a wonderful opportunity to have the president of, uh, not the United States, uh, but the president of North Point University, North Point University, which is our Assemblies of God College. And uh, Scott Hagen, he used to pastor uh, Grand Rapids first, our sister church. So I'm expecting there will probably be a few people from Grand Rapids here. But he is a wonderful preacher. I mean, he's one of the best, and I mean that. So I hope you're here next week. He and his wife are our marriage retreat speakers, so they are staying over. And he will be here next Sunday. So, so come out and support the word of God that God has placed upon his heart. And then... The Sunday after Thanksgiving, the 27th, I will finish it with part two. Again, the title of this series is Thanks and Giving. I love that because I feel as we come into the Thanksgiving season, these two attributes need to come to the forefront of our lives. I want to share a story, and I know you're standing, and I'll get to the scripture in just a moment, but I want to read this. To me, it's the epitome of what living a thankful life or a life of thank looks like, uh, excuse me, a life of thanks looks like for the believer. This is entitled Potato Chips. A little boy wanted to meet God. He knew it was a long trip to where God lived. So he packed his suitcase with a bag of potato chips and a six pack of root beer and he started his journey. When he had gone about three blocks, he met an old man. He was sitting in the park just staring at some pigeons. The boy sat down next to him and opened his suitcase. He was about to take a drink from his root beer when he noticed that the old man looked hungry. So he offered him some potato chips. He gratefully accepted and smiled at the little boy. His smile was so pretty and contagious that the little boy wanted to see him smile again. So he offered him a root beer. And again he smiled at him. The boy was delighted, that childlike faith. They sat there all afternoon eating potato chips and smiling, but they never said a word. As twilight approached, the boy realized he was getting tired and it was time for him to leave. But before he had gone more than a few steps, he turned around. He ran back to the old gentleman and gave him a hug. And he gave him the biggest smile ever and simply said, thanks. When the boy opened the door to his own house a short time later, his mom was surprised by the look of thankfulness and joy on his face. So she asked him, what did you do today that made you so happy? He replied, I had lunch with God. But before his mother could respond, he added, you know what? He's got the most beautiful smile I've ever seen. Meanwhile, the old man, also radiant with thanksgiving and joy, returned to his house. His son, who would take care of him, his son was stunned by the look of peace on his face. And he said, Dad, what did you do today that made you so happy? He replied, I ate potato chips in the park with God. However, before his son responded, he added, You know, he's much younger than I expected. <laughs> Too often we underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, being thankful, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment, or even the smallest act that shows you care, all of which has the potential to turn someone's life around. Have lunch with God and bring chips. <laughs> That's living a thankful life. First Thessalonians 5, now starting in verse 12. 
And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. In fact, I believe some translations say, you know, warn those who are idle. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Here it is. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you are calling us to do exactly what I just said, the word I just spoke, where I simply say, thank you, God. Lord, we have much to be thankful for. Yes, I know the times we're living in. God, sometimes it just gets rough. But God, we still have much to be thankful for. So God, anoint the preaching of your word. Anoint the ears to hear what you would have them hear today. And God, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I felt led over the next two Sundays. Again, next week will be uh, Pastor Scott. But over the next uh, two sermons that I preached, I just want to break down these words, thanks and giving. And I really felt as I was getting ready for this series, I thought, you know, Lord, I really want it to be something practical. If you know me by now, you know that I love to preach the word, but I love to get into hermeneutics. I love to get into the breakdown of a context of a particular passage and find some golden nuggets. And so I consider myself to be a preacher who likes to delve deep into God's word. But I just want to share with you over these next two sermons that I'm going to preach, I'm going to keep it very simple. I'm going to keep it very practical because Don't you think that's what sermons should do? They should be practical so that we can know how to practice them out in real life. I believe that's what God would have us uh, have me say. So if you'll just indulge me over these next two sermons, I just want to keep it practical. And I would say this, Lord knows, in light of our nation's current struggle and division that's going on, I think we could always use some encouragement, amen, and to realize that our God, no matter what happens, our God is in charge He's on the throne, and he's in control. So this morning, I want to talk about thanks. How do we show it? How do we show that we're thankful? How do we express it? But even beyond that, how do we foster it? How is thanksgiving in our life on a continual basis? I've broken down the word thanks into a simple acronym that I believe that you will be able to take with you and then apply in real life. Let's face it. We have 24 hours in a day, and a large part of that is already spoken for. Think about this for a moment. Most of us work anywhere from 8 to 10 hours a day. Some of you more than that. I realize that. But let's just say, give or take, average-wise, most work about 8 to 10 hours a day. Hopefully, most of us get at least 6 hours of sleep. Some of you say, I wish. But six hours of sleep, they say you should get upwards of about eight hours of sleep. So if you just take the lowest times on both of those things, let's just take eight hours a day, and you only take six hours for sleeping, even there with that minimal number, that is still 14 hours that are already spoken for in your day. That means you only have 10 hours left. And don't get me wrong with what I'm about to say. We know that a large part of that is spent at work. And I believe that God is calling us as Christians to redeem the time that we have at work. To redeem the time that we have with our coworkers, our colleagues. You know, I I find out, in fact, it's true for me here at this church. It's probably true for you at your places of work. Some of your greatest friends come from the time that you spend together at work. They become some of your, uh, your most dear of friends. But here, I want to talk about, very clearly, glorifying God and being thankful for all that God has blessed you with, with redeeming the time in a few key areas of your life. And again, this is very simple. 
but I also believe it to be very profound if we'll take it to heart. The first one, and how applicable being we're getting ready to go into a marriage retreat, but the first one I want to talk about, A, on your notes, is marriage. They say that the average married couple spends anywhere from two to two and a half hours together per day. Two to two and a half hours per day, and that also includes weekends. You would think it would go up on weekends, but according to this average, it does not. How many would agree that's not a lot of time? Two to two and a half hours. In fact, a study was shown that out of this two to two and a half hours, a third of that was spending time watching TV together. <laughs> Listen to this. Eating, eating takes up, now I, I thought this was kind of on the short end, but on average, eating takes up to 30 minutes of that time per day. Doing housework, meaning doing whatever needs to be done around the house on a particular day, takes about 24 minutes of time. And I know that I hear people today, they'll say, you know, Pastor Mike, I stay busy. And, you know, my wife and I or my husband and I, we might not have a lot of time, but we try to make quality time. And I, I, I understand that. I agree with that. But can I just have us consider today that maybe, well, being transparent here, but I'm saying it because I'm on your side, maybe we also should be looking at quantity time as well quantity time. I realize if your time is limited, that we focus more on quality, but there's something today about being in each other's presence and spending quantity, quantity time together. In fact, just about three weeks ago now, in fact, it was three weeks ago exactly, uh, my wife and I, we went to Mackinac. It was gorgeous. The first couple days, it was kind of rainy, and it was cold, and it was sleeting, and I'm thinking, I knew this was going to happen when you go to Mackinac and so forth, but it was wonderful. We relaxed. We didn't check our emails except maybe at night uh, just to, you know, see if there's anything that we needed to be aware of on the home front. We spent each day with each other and just being together, and I'll never forget it, just driving around and pulling up so we could get the best view of, uh, of the Mighty Mac and so forth. And because my time is short today, I want to say this quickly but emphatically. The couple that plays together stays together. I believe that. The couple that plays together stays together. You say, what does that mean, Pastor Mike? It's simple. Go for walks together. Go for walks. Go for drives together. How many do that? Get in the car and you just go for a drive. Do a hobby together. In fact, we, Amy and I did something on our, on our little excursion up to Mackinac. We we collected beach glass, and we're looking all over for beach glass, and it was just something we did together. Play games together. Get out Uno or, or do something fun. I feel, and I mean this with all of my heart, and again, this is a very simple, I'm not diving deep into hermeneutics and syntactical analysis of Scripture. I'm just giving you something practical that will stay with you, but I truly feel one of the best ways to glorify God is by your marriage. I believe your marriage is one of the greatest ways you can glorify God. And in order for that to happen, we need to redeem the time. The second one here, or B on your notes, and might, this might not be applicable to everyone. Maybe you don't have children. Maybe you're planning to have children, whatever. But I want to talk about children. Now, I understand something this morning. If they are already raised and they are out of your house and they're on with, you know, their life's journey then, you know, things change a bit. I realize that. But even, even then, you can still redeem things. But let me say uh, primarily to those that still have kids under the roof. Have family game nights. Family meal time where you put your phones in a basket. We went to, uh, what was it the other day? Um, El Patron, my family, my wife and I and Chloe. And while we were there, we watched this beautiful family over to our right, really sharp-looking family. Look like they had just been to church, and they're all eating, and the whole table is filled with family. You could tell they were family members. And yet I looked at one of the young girls that was there seated, looked to be right across from her, her dad, and I believe there were some aunts and uncles, maybe some grandparents there. And the entire time, she had her iPad propped up, and she was just on her iPad the entire time time. 
you know what, even though, you know, today, you know, I love to be able to have social media, I love to be able to have electronics, we have to be careful that that doesn't get our best. Our family deserves our best. Amen. Our children deserve our best. And like I said, maybe having a basket that before you sit down, you say, hey, phone's in the basket. We're spending time together. Take your son or daughter out on a date. Seriously, take them out on a date. If your kids are grown and married, and you might, you might have to be extra creative. I, my son and my, uh, my daughter-in-law were here this morning. Sometimes when, they're, when they're, they're married and they're going on with their own life and, and so forth, you have to be creative with everyone's schedules. But make it happen. I, go to every, I try to go to every one of my son's football games that he coaches. I, only, I don't know anybody on that team personally except for one young man that I've been praying for who had Hodgkin's lymphoma and also their running back who is an absolute stud heading to um, Air Force Academy. But I'm there for one person, and that's my son. I take a picture every Friday night, say, what a great place to be in watching a football game because my son is there. So have a Taco Tuesday night or have a game night. Have a night where maybe you, again, if they're outside of the home but they still live around you, say, let's have a night where we all meet for dinner together and then go get some ice cream. I'm not trying to be a downer with what I'm about to say this morning, but I've never met anyone doing a eulogy at a funeral say, when talking of a loved one, I simply wish I wouldn't have have spent so much time with them. I always hear things like, I wish I just had one more day to have one more of those talks. They say today that moms working outside the home today spend two hours with their kids on average daily. The working dad spends about an hour and 15 minutes with their kids daily. For both, much of their time is they study in this study was at a sporting event or at one of their son or daughter's extracurricular activities, like band or whatever. And that's good, but it can never replace the one-on-one time. It can never replace it. In fact, listen to this. You know this to be true. Uh, true. Schools, on average, get our kids for about eight hours per day. And with extracurricular functions, maybe another two to three hours a day is tied up there. So with that much time already gone, we need to be redeeming the time that we have left. Get this, the country of Denmark. The country of Denmark has has been named the happiest country in all of the world. Denmark, the happiest country in all of the world. And listen to this, they have the highest average time spent with their kids more than any other country in the world. I think, be, I think there's something to be said there. I must move on. How about redeeming the time three with your Lord, with God? This alarmed me when I read it. This is from Barna Research. And Barna, they do extremely good studies. And when you hear their statistics, you can know that they're probably very, very accurate. But Barna says that the average Christian, now I want to say something. I don't want to be an average Christian. How about you? I don't want to be, you know, if I brought home a C, that's average. I want to bring home A's. You know what I'm talking about? I don't want to be an average Christian, but the average Christian spends one minute per day in prayer. One minute per day in prayer. This one really got me. You would think that during COVID, with having maybe some extra time to be able to do some things and to be able to pray more. During COVID, 26 million Americans stopped reading their Bible regularly. We thought that'd be a time where people would draw close. If someone comes up to me and they say, you know, Pastor Mike, I, I, I need to meet with you. I need to schedule an appointment with you. I, I seem like I'm just not walking in victory I feel like I'm falling prey to some temptations in life. I seem to be kind of spiritually lethargic, and I feel like God is like a million miles away from me. I will ask them in a very nice way two important things. What's your daily prayer life like, and what's your devotional life like? Because I've learned in life, if you don't have a devotional life, you're going to have an emotional life. You gotta get into his word. You gotta get in 
to his word. You got to get alone with God in prayer. Not where you're just speaking to him, but when you get quiet enough to hear God speak to you in your inner man. See, so what, what your daily time in prayer in the word of God looks like, looks like, I can say to people who that's not a part of their life, probably 90% of them would say, Pastor Mike, I'm not in God's word like I should be. I'm not praying like, they, like, I, like I, I should be praying. Can I tell you that the two primary ways God speaks to you is through prayer and his word. And so if you wonder who, if God has moved, it hasn't been God moved. He never changes. It's us who have moved away from those things that we should be doing. It means that he's not a priority. Listen to Psalm 63, verse 1. Listen to the heart of David. This was a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. He said this, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My, fe- my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. And he's, of course, he's speaking of a wilderness experience. But there's something that catches my eye. You can keep that scripture up. Notice it says this, early will I seek you. It's like we give God a tithe. I don't know if you realize this, but do you realize a tithe is supposed to be your first fruits? It's not the last fruits. It should be the very first thing that we do. The first tenth belongs to God. And church, I think the same should apply with our time with God, with reading the word and being alone with him in prayer. Start early. Before the day gets busy and before all these demands come down upon you, get alone with God. Even if you have to get up 15 minutes early or a half an hour early, it's time well spent. Can I hear an amen this morning? I need to move on, but if we truly will show thanks in how we live, it involves time. Because listen to this, you know this to be true. What gets our times, what, time, what we invest in, what we invest in is what truly matters to us in life. What gets our time gets our priority. What gets our time gets our priority. So let's redeem the time. That's a great way of showing thanks. H, practice hospitality. Hospitality to me seems like a lost art today. A lost art. Hospitality, if they'll put it up on the PowerPoint, I think I have the definition. It means the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or even strangers. And that's why I give a little plug for life groups. I will admit, my wife and I, we keep busy schedules. My wife at present is literally working two jobs, not only at Vanderbilt, but also at H&R. And I know sometimes on Sundays when I play the drums twice and I preach twice, and then we have to host a life group, sometimes we can get tired. But every single time we will say this, I'm glad we had it. Why? Because hospitality is worth it because we are better together. We're better together. That's why I hope every one of you are involved in some type of a life group here at Holland First. Let me give you some practical ways. Again, very simple message. I need to stop saying that because, again, sometimes when I preach like this, I think, you know, maybe they want a deeper sermon. But, I'm, you know, maybe that'll be after we're done with this. But I believe this sermon today and the one in two weeks, it needs practice times. We need to live these things out. Here are some examples of what you can do to show hospitality. Maybe it's making a busy family a meal or taking them over a pizza at night because you know they're busy. Maybe it's it's simply cutting someone's yard because you're already out there cutting yours. I made a big mistake the other day. I cut my yard low. I cut it on two, level two. My neighbor cuts his on a level five. And his, his family's been going through something. I don't do this to rob myself of a blessing because I don't want the blessing. But I'm sharing it as a pastor to you just to share the story that my next door neighbors are going through a hard time right now. Their boy is on life support. Their boy needs a miracle. And so I cut my yard and I thought I need to cut theirs. But I forgot to move it down to two or move it moved up to five. And I shaved that man's yard. I'm thinking... If he already doesn't have enough trouble, now he's going to see his yard shave. And I'm thinking, man. And I went over to him. I said, I am so sorry. He looked at me and goes, it's fall. Just thank you so much for doing that. I really appreciate it. You know, 
Sometimes it's those little things that we just don't think of. You're already on your rider or you're already pushing the mower. Maybe go do the next door neighbor's yard because who knows what they might be going through. Maybe here at church, offering your time to paint a room or to work on the grounds or, you know, leading a life group. Maybe it's seeing a stranger like the Bible talked about. Maybe it's seeing a stranger and God drops into your spirit, you know, pay for their meal. Pay for their meal. Listen to Romans chapter 12. Verses 9 to 13. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. And honor giving preference to one another. But notice now this. Not lagging in diligent, diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer, and here it is, distributing to the needs of the saints, but then also given to hospitality. Given to hospitality. In fact, the N- I'm in the New King James Version there. The NIV says it this way, practice hospitality. What do they say about practice? Practice makes perfect, or at least it should make us better. And I believe if we can practice hospitality, Lord only knows the good that can happen in other people's lives. The Message Bible says it this way. It's right there on the screen. Be inventive in hospitality. Think outside of the box of how you can bless someone. Do something that you normally wouldn't do. Be inventive with hospitality. Listen to how the Living Bible says it. I want to read all of it. Verse 13 of Romans 12. When God's children are in need, you be the one to help them out. And get into a habit of inviting guests home for dinner. Or if they need lodging, give them lodging for the night. The bottom line is this. One of the ways we live a thankful life is to return the favor in life by being hospitable. Yes, it's going to require some work in this already busy world. But boy, it is so worth it. It is highly rewarding. Now the next one. This one's big. So T. Redeem the time. H, practice hospitality. A, check the attitude. Check the attitude. If you know the phrase, say it with me. They say your attitude determines your altitude. You know, how, you know living you know, at a level like the, you know, meaning how far you're going to go in life. Your attitude determines your altitude. But I think most, if not all, would agree with me this morning. That a person with a great attitude is refreshing compared to someone who lives like an old miser. Can I please get an amen today? We want to be refreshing. The Bible says, those who refresh, will they themselves be refreshed? Attitude means this. It means a settled way of thinking. You ever had someone say, you need to settle down? That's where it comes from. It's having An attitude where it's settled down in the way of thinking or your feeling about something or someone. Typically one that is reflected in a person's behavior. Please listen to this. There's some, and I've met him before, in the house of God that they'll say, you know what, Pastor Mike? I am who I am. I'm not really concerned with what other people say about me or they think about me. And you know what? I understand that up to a point But I would also throw this out. Maybe you should care a little bit in key areas because of the one you serve and the one you represent. You represent Jesus. You know, I I do. And I see people would say, I don't really care what people think about me. You need to care. I don't mean in a way that you need their approval. I understand that. But we should care what people think about us because we represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know this to be true, what I'm about to say. You can say someone's name. You can say someone's name, and immediately a trait will come to mind. Immediately. I can look at Dr. Cole, and immediately the trait that comes to my mind is incredibly, incredibly smart. Incredibly smart. But you know what it's like when you see someone. 
You can see them walking down the street. They can come into the house of God. They can come into your place of work. And immediately, if, you, if somebody were to ask you, what do you think about that person? Immediately a trait will come to the surface. Things like this. And let me give you the, the pro and the con. Instead of someone, you know, getting this last one, hopefully they'll say when you think of somebody, they're thoughtful versus having a big mouth. They're caring versus being rude. They're kind instead of being harsh. They're loving instead of being crass. Give me the first one of those instead of the latter one of those any day. As Christians, we have no business, hear me, we as Christians have no business being a smart aleck. We have no business being a smart aleck. And sometimes you can have a good heart. They say, well, he's a little rough, but he's got a good heart. Well, sometimes the people can't get past your attitude. And the problem is that's not only an indictment upon you, that's an indictment upon the one you serve. We have to check our attitude. Ephesians 5, verse 2. Ephesians 5, verse 2. And walk in love means it's got to be a way of life. It's a lifestyle. As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, listen, as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. I've learned in life, and I think we all have learned this, it's not really about us. Life's not about us. It's about him. It's about others. So have the proper attitude. I'm preaching to myself today. I don't always have the best attitude, but I'm trying because I know I'm not just representing me. I'm representing Jesus Christ, the one I serve. It shows that I'm thankful, thankful for all that he's done in my life. The letter N, the letter N, give to the needy, give to the needy. I'd ask, I'm gonna ask for a show of hands here. How many here have ever been in need before? Would you lift your hand? You've been in need before, okay? Now with an uplifted hand, ever had God meet that need tangibly through another person? What I would say then, let's be that person. Let's be that person. Matthew 6, verses 1 to 4. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, I love it again because of the word therefore. It's always there for a reason. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will himself reward you. Now some might say, you know, Pastor Mike, I don't want to be rewarded in heaven. I just love to help when I see a need. That's great, but don't go broadcasting it. Don't go broadcasting it. I look at the virtuous woman. We tend to think about the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31 on Mother's Day. But listen to a verse, what it says about her when it comes to the attribute of giving to the needy. Just one verse, Proverbs 31, verse 20. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. To the needy. You can never, and I repeat, never go wrong when you help someone that's in need, ever. The odds were stacked against Edna Agawangi. Her favor from the moment was lacking the moment she was born in Kenya. Soon after her arrival into the world, the country entered an extended era of a devastating drought that resulted in widespread starvation. On top of that, to say that girls were not prioritized to attend school, as Ogawangi put it, is a polite understatement. Fast forward to a time when things turned around for her in Ogawangi's life. She made it to the United States. That she believed that's where she was to go, where she was able to obtain an education, even going as far to earn her master's in social work. 
This prepared her to fulfill her life's calling, which she describes as, quote, returning to her home and literally handing out food to the young ones. After all she had been through in her childhood in Kenya, all Agawangi wanted to do with her life was to be physically present for the world's poor children. Agawandi is continuing to make this happen through her work as the chief impact officer at Rise Against Hunger, an international hunger relief organization that distributes food and provides life-changing aid to the world's most vulnerable and has committed to ending world hunger by 2030 in that area. As of today, Rise Against Hunger has provided more than three hundred million meals to the hungry. In addition, and perhaps most importantly, by reaching out personally to the poor, Agawangi is able to teach them, and with the empathy of one who has experienced it herself, that through education and perseverance, anyone can be anything they want and make a difference in the world. As Agawangi likes to say, and I quote, children are not the leaders of tomorrow, rather they are the leaders of today. She's making the most of her opportunity by giving to the needy because at one time where she used to live, she felt that firsthand. She could have stayed in the United States, but she said, no, I want to go back home and be a blessing to the people that I am closest to. The next one, and the band can come if they'd like and begin to play. I'm wrapping it up, and I got two more. The next one is Be Kind. How many would say do you feel like our world could use a little kindness? Have you noticed, listen again, very simple thing to ask you today is this. Have you noticed when you're going through life, do you notice more smiles or frowns? Do you notice more joyful demeanors or do you, do you see kind of a scowl on people's face? I think the answer for us as believers, if we are the aroma of Christ, we need to be kind. Most of you have probably heard of this. Maybe some of you have not. It's in your notes. It'll be on the PowerPoint here in a second. It's called the think principle. I don't know how many times my mom would say to me, you know, Mike, think before you talk. <laughs> think before you talk. But some things to ask yourself for the think principle, is, is it true? say, Pastor Mike, it is true. They messed up. It's true. But is it hurtful? It can be true. We're not going to deny maybe what they did was wrong, and it's true they made a mistake, but by what us saying back to them, is it going to be hurtful? Is it going to be inspiring? Maybe inspires them to want to rise above the challenges they have faced. Is it necessary? How many has ever been there before? Was that really necessary? We need to ask ourselves before we say something, is it necessary? I'm speaking to myself. Is it true? Is it hurtful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And here's where we get this this point here. Is it kind? Is it kind? Say it with me if you know it. A little kindness goes a long way. Why does it go a long way? Because it's largely absent in our world today kindness goes a long way. Remember, kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. Colossians 3, 12 to 15 says this. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, put it on. It's like you're wearing it. Put on kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has to complain against another, even as Christ has forgave you, you must also forgive. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body. And notice the last part. What am I talking about this morning? And be thankful. Put on Wear it like a robe, a robe of kindness. Romans 2, 4. Or do you 
show contempt for the riches of God's kindness. His forbearance means long suffering, his patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. I just wonder what a little kindness could do for someone that maybe at present doesn't have a relationship with Christ. I wonder if they see it in you, they might want to come to know the one you serve. Here's a great definition of kindness. You can put that up and then I'll go to my last point. We're done. Christian kindness. It means being steadfast in love toward another person, even as God has loved us with a steadfast love that never fails. It means being faithful to another, trustworthy and loyal. Kindness is gentle and loving, even when there are times in our lives that tempt us to be harsh and hard. Deem the time, practice hospitality, check the attitude, give to the needy, be kind, and this one wraps it up so well. Last one, S. Think of your salvation often. Think of your salvation often. The best way we can show thanks for all that he has done is to think and remember how he saved us. How he brought us out of the kingdom of darkness into the light of his son. What he's done in our life. I close with Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. <laughs> I didn't even recognize it until I just saw it. Every scripture this morning has basically had this. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. Verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God, also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. There's a song that we used to sing probably, and Pastor Larry will know this, I'm not putting you on the spot, you don't have to sing this this morning. But there was a song probably two decades ago that was popular in the Christian circles of singing and church settings. And he happened to be an individual who was a former worship pastor right here at Holland First. Anybody remember James Huey? Ivan and Chantel, anybody else you remember James, Todd, you know James Huey very well. He wrote, you might not know this, he used to be on staff here at Holland First. He wrote the song, When I Think About the Lord. How many know that song? When I think about, we should get Mary up here and have her sing it. Listen to the words. There, it's right up there. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and he turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground, it makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all of the praise. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you are worthy of all of the glory glory and all of the praise. He's worthy of it. When I think about the Lord, when I think about the Lord, all I know is this. If we continually keep at the forefront of our cerebral cortex all that God has done in our lives, how can we not live a life of thanks? How can we not? 
Father, thank you, Lord, so much. Father God, for giving us your son. God, I'm thankful that you knew that I would need a savior. So you sent your very best. You sent your son. That anybody who would believe upon him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, I'm here to boldly pronounce to us today that we might be in a season on our calendar of thanksgiving. But for the believer, our life should be one of thanks and giving every day of the calendar year. For all you've done in our life, for all that you've done, we're thankful. God, I pray if there's someone here that maybe does not have a relationship with Christ as Lord, that right here, right now, they would say, Jesus, I need the, I need you. I need you to be Savior and Lord of my life. The greatest way that I can show thanks, Jesus, is by asking you to be Lord of my life and to surrender my life to you. And from this day forward, for the rest of my life, I make a covenant with you that I'll serve you. I pray that if you've prayed that prayer, you will come and see me right after this service today. I would love to give you some tools and resources. But I want to speak also to the crowd that's assembled in this room, the people that are in this room, that I would say the Holy Spirit is saying to us today that in our daily life, be thankful. It's so easy to gripe. It's so easy to complain. It's so easy to see the glass half empty. But God, I've said it so many times, if you never do another thing for us, you've done enough by giving us your son who has promised that all who would serve and believe upon him shall have everlasting life with him in heaven someday. So God, help us to be thankful. And I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet this morning. Are you thankful today for God and his goodness to you through his son Jesus and through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us? These altars are open. Again, I'll be down here to pray with anybody that would love prayer. Again, if you committed your life to Christ, let me know about it. I'd love to introduce you to our Alpha class and give you some other things, but receive this blessing today. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his incredible peace to the praise and to the glory of his name in Jesus' name. And we all said a loud amen. Amen and amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord one more hand clap of praise. I love you guys. Have an awesome day. God bless you.